Hi, welcome. I'm Elizabeth Horner. I'm the Director of Education at the Carlos Museum, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to In This Moment, a new series of talks. Um, we began this year about the relationship between art and art museums and the complex social is issues of our time. So um, we'll have today's talk, and if you have questions, please put them into the Q&A and we will ask them live and they'll be answered live. They won't be answered in the Q&A. We are thrilled today to have Megan O'Neill, Assistant Professor of Art History at Emory University and Faculty Curator of the Art of the Americas at the Michael C. Carlos Museum, in conversation with renowned interdisciplinary artist, Gala Porras Kim, who lives and works in Los Angeles. They'll be talking about her art practice and the roles of art and museums in the world today. So thank you both for being with us and Go ahead. <laughs> Hello. Um, well, I'm so glad. Thank you, Elizabeth, um, for organizing this and for to have us here. It's always a pleasure to talk to Gala. Um, so uh, I'd like to just start by having Gala show us some of her work um, and uh, then and talk about the work and then we will um, I have lots of questions and I'm sure that will be a robust conversation. Yes. Well, hi, Megan. Um, <laughs> thanks for inviting me to talk today. Uh, it's always really nice to be able to talk to you and have some feedback, you know, and I think in terms of my overall practice, it, it has been my goal to find museum people who will be able to suspend information long enough and, uh, entertain conversation. So I'm glad that we're able to do this talk today. Um, so I'm gonna show some of my uh, past work so you get a sense of my practice. And then I think at the end, maybe I'll show some of the works that I'm uh, working on right now uh, for the exhibitions next year, which I think you, I really wanna know what you think, but um, oh, here we go, let me see. Uh, here, okay. <clears throat> so, some of the works that I had been making um, were to see the relationship between uh, language and music a long time ago, and more like what are the, not necessarily institutions, but framing uh, that of the written language and how it, the, it really changes like oral traditions or things that are supposed to be more ephemeral. Uh, and so then I actually, after I finished grad school, I went back to, uh, study Zapotec to make this record, which is a translated uh, version of whistled Zapotec, uh, um, of spoken Zapotec language into its whistle tones. And so through the process of making this work, I was really interested in how like an official version um, of the written language um, could be made more democratic by like people every day being able to decide what their own language was written like. And so there was these, um, this project that I made that was going around uh, Mexico and um, asking people who had like these uh, shops, Oaxacan shops to uh, tell me what they, how they thought their own language was sort of written. And so I produced the, these copies of their existing signage uh, translated into Zapotec, uh, but the spelling was determined by the people who uh, work there. So this lady is the one who decided how this tamales de Oaxaca was spelled. Here's another um, picture of that. So like the, you know, the cheese is cheese. And so, you know, it might not be spelled the official way, but um, it is uh, spelled correctly for that specific person, correctly. Yeah. And so, you know, it might not be spelled, what that be? Oh no, wait, was that, that was feedback. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so then here we go with the institution part. So then I have always been interested in how objects actually exist within uh, institutions. And this is one of the first projects I made working in collaboration with a museum. It was with the, it, this exhibition was at the uh, Hammer Museum here in LA. And it was working with artifacts who, which were in the Fowler collection, which is an ethnographic museum that is cousins with the um, Hammer, which is the contemporary museum. Uh, and so in the Fowler, they had this artifact that had lost their cataloging number. So they had no idea like what it was, where it came from, but they're, you know, they're curators and conservators and staff who always are projecting and trying to find out what these objects are. And so the, the works have these like post-it notes with notes from like the seventies of different people trying to be like, I think this is like a stick from 
Africa and then it's crossed out in the 80s where the new person is like I don't think it's African I think it's Asian or something and so in a sense it's like this editing of historical record as as, as more and more information or technology or data is available but then in a sense what was interesting to me was this like real big impulse to try and access this historical past which is no way to actually uh, access and so um, the exhibition is is uh, consists of making these reconstructions based on the notes of these uh, conservator notes. So, for example, this triptych is based on this, you know, these objects here in this little blue base are the objects from the Fowler, and they had a note that said these little trash bits belong to a ceramic. And so the, you know, it was just like a Ziploc bag full of like literally trash. And so, but the um, collections manager told me that there was a collector at one point that had a ceramic in his house and he just used it as a coin dish. You know how like you put tchotchkes in it and then he donated that ceramic to the museum with the trash inside of it. And so when they accessioned it into the collection, the objects within them became part of the whole object. And then years later, the ceramic itself got lost. So all that remained was the Ziploc bag that said, these things belong to a ceramic. And so based on that note here, I made this like reconstruction ceramic, which <clears throat> literally makes the object belong to it. And then the drawing is the, the final version of the triptych because it's like a, I think of it as sort of documentation of them being together since I can't literally install those objects uh, in the reconstruction. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> sorry. And then one of the things about this exhibition that I really loved was that <clears throat> Um, through the process of uh, moving the objects from the Fowler to the hammer, the Fowler staff had to come up with a loan form. So they had to come up with insurance information and the object description. And so in a sense, it was the beginning of this like paperwork shuffle, institutional paperwork, where it's like, there's no way to actually know how much these objects are worth, but you have to, you know, the system itself is made to prompt all of this information. <clears throat> so I think that now they're all like, $10 insurance value minus this like uh, ivory tusk, which was 50 bucks. So some arbitrary thing, no? Um, and also the naming of the objects became part, like uh, they came out of our conversation. So there was like a uh, one uh, grass thing that, you know, one of the curators was like, yeah, that looks just like something uh, a friend gave to me when I was pregnant. So now it's officially called uh, January, January is her name. So it's called January's fertility belt until somebody else comes up with a better version because it is looking like her fertility belt. You know, so in a sense, it was just like, how can these objects re be uh, representative of some something in people's current life until like as a placeholder until like, you know, there's like alien technology that we can time travel and actually see what the original version is, no? Um, and then here we, uh, come to Megan and I's project. <laughs> and so, you know, the first time that I met Megan, I wanted to, I got invited to make this project for the, uh, for the uh, PST, it was like this like Getty show. And my work was, I wanted to work with the, collect, the West Mexico ceramic collection at LACMA, but I was really working in the contemporary building. And so somebody put me in touch with Megan who was working there at the time. And then I was really interested in the, in the, you know, institutional procedure of like collecting, you know, private collecting and then like LACMA as a public museum, how they sort of navigate those things because with donors and like time and labeling, um, you know, institutions have to navigate a lot of very sensitive and uh, diff, uh, contradicting, um, you know, perks. I don't know if it's perks or like, uh, functions? I don't know. So in a sense, the, the, the project was based on this uh, room, which I think that if I'm not, there are artifacts from West Mexico that are mostly, were mostly found in graves. Um, and, but what was interesting to me was that when I went in to see this room, you know, this man, Proctor Stafford, his name was like in every single label. And so then I thought it's like, okay, if I'm looking in this room, like the thing that appears and repeats the most is this man's name. So it could be actually interesting to know why is the private collector's name still um, shown in here. And, you know, it's, it's like has to do with like 70s style, like um, a session policy or whatever. No, um, but in a sense, some of the conversations that Megan and I were talking, uh, were talking about is how uh, people who work in institutions now sort of 
inherit all of these policies and methods that from like the time when they actually uh, came into the collection. Um, and so I actually just really wanted to know whether that ever expired, you know, because because if I was, I always try to think of the object in sort of first person where if I was the ceramic, I was like, my function is to be buried with somebody forever. And now I'm on view with this man's name, like, who is this guy? I don't even know. And so in a sense, it's like, it's, you know, and so I think about it like some sort of like branding or shirt that you don't like. And it's like, I don't like this, this label. And so in a sense, it's like, when are you gonna get an outfit change? I don't know, you know, so does it ever expire? Especially because, you know, um, the thing about Parker Stafford was also that he sold the objects to the museum instead of doing some sort of like donation, which is like most of the time, I think when there's like a, a, a this, this gesture of, you know, uh, philanthropy where you donate your objects to the museum then you get some sort of dibs or something even though you get a tax write-off anyway um so the project was uh to they were different phases this thing was so big that um but the one of them was to i wanted to separate them by state and so i made these <clears throat> drawings that were like jalisco Najari and colima which was uh, sort of separating the objects by like most known location to see if they would have some sort of like repeat, re, repeating patterns or something. And I do think that there's some like, you know, Najarit one, there's like the the ladies who sit like this, like this is the only one that has ladies that sit like this style. Um, and I don't know if it's right, but you know, like these are like more obese. And so like, why are the, you know, like the more chunky uh, ceramics here? And then these ones are the ladies ones. And then there was some like, <clears throat> Uh, I, I don't know, I think this one had the most. So I think it, it in included a lot of the, <coughs> the other ones, but there's no ladies that sit like that. So it's mostly like how the cataloging of these things, because then I thought, <clears throat> you know, Colima, Nayarit and Jalisco actually didn't exist in the time that these were made. So then I actually have thought since the project make an update to make it be um, instead of Colima or Nayarit or uh, Jalisco, that it would be like a coordinate, like a geogra geographical coordinate instead of the name of an actual state, which was not the case, you know what I mean? I'm like, oh wait, that wasn't there anymore. Um, <clears throat> and so I also wanted to uh, make this, you know, cause in conversations with Megan, so this is a project that was like, really the objects come out of talking to Megan uh, and the issues with the provenance or like, I just ask her questions and make works uh, based on the responses. And she had mentioned that, you know, one of the known provenances of these ceramics were that they had uh, um, been uh, in private collections right before. And Proctor Stafford in an interview said that they had been adorning mantles all over the world. And so I just was like, okay, so let's make a, these sort of drawings of how they would be, you know, like in the immediate past life before it was on the grave, no? Um, so here they are um, in different mantles, uh, dogs. Wait. And then <clears throat> this is um, also to think of them in the, in the near future. Uh, so one of the issues with these ceramics, like I said, is that um, it's very difficult to sort of track their provenance. So I wanted to make uh, an object that would be the best future uh, artifacts. And so these are uh, these ceramics are based on general shapes that are found in the collection, um, but they have this GPS tracker, which will continue to track them. So in the future future, they will be um, able to be well documented, I hope. <clears throat> Then some of the projects that I'm uh, more recent one. This is last year I uh, made an uh, installation for the Whitney Biennial, which was uh, three different ways of um, decipher, not interpreting the text of this La Mojarrestela one, which is a monument that has this undeciphered writing text. Uh, this work is uh, one uh, looking at the the, sh the formal shapes in the text. So the box inside of it has uh, these plexi sheets that have that are separating the text by um, you know, size, so like all the squares or all the circles or all the faces in the in the stone. So in the best case scenario, you can pull one out and like align it and just like read it by all of the squares and whatever, no? 
uh, this middle one is based on uh, the idea of like Mesoamerican uh, obsidian mirrors. So they use the obsidian mirrors as like divination tool to find out things about oneself that they didn't know. And so the object in front of it is La Mojarra with um, these, these holes, which is like little bits that are damaged and scraped off of the original one. So I thought that La Mojarra would be looking at itself, trying to figure out what the missing bits of it was. Uh, and then the third one is this, um, this uh, work that uh, is about the, the sort of uh, difference between a very formal structural uh, uh, structure setting of the text. So the, the backdrop is the, the text, how it's incised into the stone. And then the object in front of it is the text, the characters, but they're suspended in this um, kind of like a lava lamp thing. So it rotates and as it rotates, it makes these like different um, connections. And so when you see them next to each other, my hope was that they would align and then you'd be able to be like automatic writing or something next to the actual writing. Uh, oh, this one I wanted to show because Megan, you don't know about this one. So this one is a, is a two, uh, what is it? Proposal for the reconstituting of ritual elements of the Sun Pyramid at Teotihuacan. So, you know, we have a common friend, Matthew Rob, who is a curator and he's like a Teotihuacan expert. And he made this exhibition at LACMA, which was recent finds of the Sun Pyramid at Teotihuacan. And two of the objects were these like giant stones that had been found at the top of this pyramid. And you know, like Teotihuacan is like an amazing, crazy structure that it's like, if you just found these stones inside of the top, it was definitely not made for human eyes. You know, like there's no door or whatever. And so in a sense, like the people who made it took a lot of energy to get these stones and stash them at the top of this ritual pyramid that is like the connection between humans and like this sun deity or whatever, no? And so like when I talked to Matthew, it was like, well, did he even think about what would happen if you take out this like integral part of the pyramid, you know, like is, are we having COVID because of the misalignment of this like spiritual thing? Yeah, we have no idea what happens, no? And so in a sense, I was thinking if I was like, like the, who, whose is this pyramid? And it's the, 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 my current interest is more like, uh, you know, artifacts that are ritual objects or objects for the afterlife whose function is still ongoing. So in a sense, it's like, you know, the afterlife is forever and like spiritual relationship to something else doesn't actually stop. And so what happens when you like, you know, through the process of archeology span or displaying them, you sort of break this connection. And so this project was to um, make these replicas of those stones to put them back and fill the hole that they left inside of the pyramid. And so to do that, I was like, okay, Matthew, help me figure out how you would actually get these stones back in the pyramid. And he said that I had to like ask Ina and propose to them because, you know, Mexico has also owns the copyright to all of the antiquities of the country. So I had to ask for a permit to make the replica to begin with. And then <clears throat> this letter goes with the piece, which is literally like, I'll donate it for free if you just put it back in the hole, no? Um, yeah, that, those are the, now we're talking about really super recent and future projects. Um, this one we were talking about really recent. It's a, uh, I was invited to participate in this uh, in plain sight, um, initiative that was made by artist uh, Rafa Esparza and Castles here in LA that was 80 that it's a collective of 80 artists and we were um, making this uh, sky writing on top of eight, uh, sites where detention sites across the country where kids are detained not just kids I think it's just everybody's detained um, and so we were invited to come up with uh, text that would be written on top of um, the detention center. So mine was uh, uh, written on top of Rio Grande detention center in Texas. And the phrase that I did was mi cielo tecueme, which is uh, my, my dear, I love you. Or, I mean, there's so many subtle variations of that because tqm is kind of like a Spanish version of like, I mean, it's literally te quiero mucho, which I, is I love you, um, but, you know, TQM, like everybody knows what that means. It's kind of like WTF or like TTYL or something like that, no? Um, and then mi cielo is like my darling or my dear, but it's also cielo is sky. So it just was this, this idea of like how, what, what type of message 
somebody in the detention center would want to read. So the audience for this uh, text is the people who are detained instead of like a general public or like the, the people who are running the camp, um, the detention center. Um, and it's also like a general message that, you know, it's, it's a, a endearing sort of thing. I mean, I also just thought that, you know, it's such a, it's such a difficult subject to really talk about that, um, that maybe some sort of uh, soft connection would be nice to, to feel if you were there. Um, and then if we have brief time, I'm gonna talk about my two projects that I'm working now, which uh, is, I guess I could just show you a proposal drawing because it doesn't exist. And so the, the work that I was doing in Cambridge, I was uh, at doing a fellowship at Harvard for the past year. Uh, was with the uh, collection of the Peabody Museum. And they have their, uh, these artifacts that were dredged from Chichen Itza. Uh, and so the project, is, uh, so Chichen Itza, uh, the sacred cenote at Chichen Itza is like the rain gods uh, ritual site. And so it was dredged in like the 1900s and a lot, by this consul, American consul, and through all of these legal loopholes, he was able to get them to the Peabody. And so I saw them there. Uh, and so the project is, is how to use similar litigation in legal uh, ways um, to put them back. And so in a sense, it's just litigating on behalf of Chalk, the rain god, you know, with property rights and all of these things to get those objects who, which really belong to him uh, back into his property. And so the installation will be the, I mean, the proposed installation, so we don't even know how close it will be, is to have the object, the artifacts that were dredged, borrowed from the Peabody, and they would be um, installed under a water dripper, so chalk would be in the water, because he is everywhere, and in every liquid, and then the water would um, drip on the objects, and they would dissolve into his, it's there for him, no? So then that, that's sort of the proposed uh, installation, but we, we, can, we will see how practical it can be, no? Um, and then, so that's sort of a, you know, the, the it's, 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 I guess it's a way in which you can see how like the original proposal of a project might not be practical at all. And somehow it will, you know, come to a compromise with the, how, what could actually get made. Um, so this actually will be shown at the Sao Paulo Biennial uh, whenever it opens, um, who knows when. And so it's, it's, it's the, the general idea is to use litigation in the way to, to litigate for the afterlife and use these human sort of, you know, ethical shapes to bring it back to a spiritual reconstitution. Uh, and, and then like side note, there's also, you know, like I was thinking that I would litigate also on behalf of like uh, Lucia, the oldest mummy in the Americas who definitely is on view. This is part of this um, next project, which is, you know, thinking about body parts and collections. And so this is um, a, a work that will be installed in the Gwangju Biennial next year in Korea and is thinking it's similar where it's like they have this bodies, you know, a lot of museums have body parts in the, in the collection. And so the, ex, the installation is to find a way to contact this afterlife and this specific dead person and ask them where they would rather be because they definitely do not want to be in a collection because they were in the ground, like living their best life, living their best afterlife. And so in a sense, uh, we're gonna uh, hire a shaman who will, uh, get in touch with this body and ask them where they would want to be. And the way that it's shown is through this um, paper marbling process. So paper marbling is the most uh, uncontrollable sort of form of um, image making because it's like literally ink suspended in water. So you can't actually control the way that the image will be. And so in the moment in which the ink is suspended, the shaman will contact the afterlife. The dead person will control the image. We will make a print and then it will be where they would potentially want to be. That's the two works I'm working on now, Megan. Wow, this is amazing. Thank you so much, Gala, for this incredible <laughs> tour through your work. Um, I come up with a list of questions before because I was mm -hmm. like, what if we don't have anything to talk about, which is ludicrous, right? Like we always have things to talk about. And now I have a, a list of more as you 
you your work brings up so many ideas and and I realized when you started talking that I didn't properly introduce you or um, <laughs> right, but I think you I think you introduced yourself pretty well right it's better to give you the floor. Um, I mean you've worked in multiple countries you've worked you know communicating with many museums and I have to say when I was at LACMA and. I received this sort of panicked email from the contemporary art curators like we don't know what to tell her, can you talk to her and um, you know and then proceeded just these wonderful like so many emails and then we would meet for a meeting and it would be like oh my god three hours have just passed and and I just want to say like working with you opened up my curatorial practice and my teaching as well in ways that I had never expected. And um, that has been really wonderful for me as a person and as a scholar and as a curator. So I just want to publicly thank you for that, right? Oh, you're just welcome. I mean, thank you. Wait, what'd you say? Thank you for putting up. <laughs> right, there were times where I was like, oh my God, I'm overwhelmed by all of these questions. Or the, uh, I mean, you, you showed your letter to Ina Right, and I received one of those letters as well, and then a series of annotations on that letter. Yeah, <laughs> yes, so that. Yeah. yes, so yeah. yeah, because the I didn't show that image, but it was actually you know the main point of it was to just literally you know, and I also think that you know one of the main audiences for most of my projects is the people who is working in the museum. So it's like a literally a letter directed to you, where it's like, hey, Megan. Does Proctor Stafford's name ever expire? Like, you know, and I know that they're sort of, you're stuck because of, you know, museum bureaucracy or ways of framing or whatever. But in a sense, it's just like the audience looking is not that the, the point is to, I mean, best case scenario is that it results in something. But for me, the, the main uh, purpose and function of the work is to like, through this dialogue that we're having, like the audience might be able to just see this these, these issues with the institution, the way it functions without having to resolve something because how can we do that? You know what I mean? Yes, you could, I can't do it, but you definitely can do it somehow. I don't know how, that's not my job. <laughs> right, and it, it's also important how, like you and I kind of argued quite a bit because, yeah. and I see that there's a question in the, on the chat that says, clarify reference to the person's name on the objects. Isn't that important in attracting donors? which was you know, a conversation that we had. And you know, when yeah. you were making the indexes, the indices that, um, and maybe can you pop one of those up on the screen in which one of the things I remember you saying is that you organize them by size yeah. because that is something that we know, Actually, right? Yeah. Um, there's one. So it's information that we know as opposed to all the information that has been lost, right? Just and literally so, not the only thing size exactly um and but the thing with the donor's name or the seller's name is for me that's also a fact that we know right yeah. and so i found it interesting that you wanted to remove that when it is you know even though it may not be something you want to prioritize it is information that we know and it's also important information right that the history of the piece and you made your um, the the works on the mantelpiece to try to reconstruct their journeys before then. But what I was trying to argue to you is that that individual's name was actually really important to to have that history of the object as well. Right. I mean, I do think that it's also the way that it's presented in the gallery space because you know these objects have like an ancient life before they were buried, and then it's life after it pops out in the ground or current modern life, which it is all of these donors. But in a sense, I thought that the the way that you know when when the general public goes into these museums is not about this current life. It's about this like historical past and like look what they did back in the day, blah blah. And so in a sense, I was like, just be very clear about it because I would definitely love a show on how these objects exist in post, you know, uh, popping out of the ground life. Like how much tax write off did he get? That's also something you know. You know what I mean? Like, how do these objects actually function within current modern life, which is not only, uh, yes, it's important to know the, the near history of who just had it, but it's not, you know, some of the, if it's going to be about that type of knowledge, then it's just not to 
because right now it just feels like you're giving some sort of credit to him. But in a sense, it was like, why not include how much tax write-off he got? Like, why not include the fact that he, as a private person, is building his own legacy with these objects and not just like being this uh, um, philanthropic, like anonymous person, you know what I mean? And so in a sense, it's just, um, those both all of those things exist you know where it's like you know there are altruistic uh, collectors that will do um, um, donate works to it but I think that with Proctor Stafford it was just like you can I could tell that it was like this sort of like Indiana Jones style guy who was like I am the one who found these objects like I am so cool because he literally said that uh, in the interview that I heard, he was like, the, you know, my the way that I collected and presented these works is the first time that these objects had been seen as artworks and not as art historical objects. So I'm like, is he an artist? Because he's doing like really conceptual moves where it's like, oh, this cup is not a cup anymore. Now it's a sculpture. And so in a sense, it was like, if that was a, if that, that makes re a set of really interesting questions about, you know, the collector's role in this like sort of building of these um, legacies of, people and and so in in a way that overshadows this historical past of what the objects are because there's no information you know what i mean because we don't know what they're actually for and so like the actual facts that we know will overshadow those things and it is actually more interesting in a sense yeah i i totally agree and and i will say that when when i was a university professor before i became a curator and now i'm both at emory which is really amazing to be able to do both and to indoctrinate my students to ask the kinds of questions that you're asking, um, let's say inspire them, not indoctrinate them, is um, actually in my survey of uh, Art of Ancient Mesoamerica, which I'm teaching right now, and I think some of my students are here in the Zoom room, um, that I had a really difficult time teaching ancient West Mexico because there was so little information known about the um, you know, the archaeology, right? And I remember, so Virginia Fields, I was teaching in LA, Virginia Fields, who's now passed away, was the curator then. And I'd be like, please tell, make her say yes to give us a tour because I don't really have anything to say, right? Mm -hmm. But then when I started thinking about these pieces in their historical context of the 20th century, now it's my favorite lecture to give for the, well, not my favorite, they're all my favorites, yeah. but like thinking about how these pieces had lives in the 50s on somebody's mantle or in the background of a movie, a Hitchcock movie set, yes. or then these claims of, yes, I'm an artist, I'm making them into a collection. I'm changing your perception of these, right? Proctor Stafford, mm -hmm. as well as uh, Earl Stendhal and other dealers and collectors, like they were, Vincent Price, like they were working so hard to change perceptions of them, which I think was, they felt that it was a noble endeavor, but it also, of course, it was commercial for them as well. well that's the thing that I'm thinking about is like, of course, those are really interesting conversations to have, but the fact that these objects were buried with somebody, in a sense, it's like, it's, it's similar to the idea with the two stones in the pyramid, where it's like, oh, since we don't actually know how the afterlife functions, how do we know that, you know, the beliefs of somebody who's not here anymore, like we have just ripped their like key to the afterlife or like removed their pillow and now they're like rolling in the grave without their like thing that they need. And so I think that it's the question that I'm having is of course that the, the institution today has the motivation, you know, like specific motivations of today where it's like, yes, how does these function? Uh, but it's also how to, not have that be more important than whatever the person who was buried with this object believed for that object. Yeah, you well, and, and I think that's why, you know, I don't, I haven't quite figured out how to do this in the museum, right? Because our collection at the Carlos Museum is, you know, we have similar issues, right? Things went through the art market, they went through private collectors, they've been donated to the museum and we present them as this window into the past. Right. And how do we present them? Yes, we want to use them to educate about the past because they're actually some of our only evidence we have about the past. Right. These ceramic sculptures from Kalima were amazing. Right. Yeah. Um, so how do we present them as a window into the past, but also about the present as well and thinking about institutions and, and reflecting on 
our role as an as an inheritors of these institutions that you know we didn't make right and and how do we think about uh redoing that i don't have that answer yet which is why i love uh artist um interventions um, well I, mean, I do think that in a sense it's just differentiating between <laughs> archaeological objects like i said you know like if it's like the dinner plate of somebody a long time ago like whatever no but in a sense it's like you know somebody who's dead the afterlife is still ongoing so in a sense it's like oh well it's literally if somebody was here and you like take their stuff from their house you know so uh, and that's sort of the issue with these west mexico ceramics not necessarily that they're archaeological or they're talking about the current collector or whatever it's mostly that their original function is still supposed to be ongoing yeah yeah and and the issue of course is that that has been interrupted, right? 1950s by we don't know who did it. Though now that we are in the Stendhal Gallery archives, which is oh, amazing know. to have uh, Gala as the artist in residence at the Getty, because we can work together in, you know, like, oh, here's some new amazing pictures or letters that we found um, in the archives where we can even reconstruct more. I, I, I call what has happened to these objects because of our conversations, object amnesia, right? And how do you reconstruct? Oh my God, your dog is present! Yay, um, Gary. Um, and you know, like, but then how do you reverse that completely, right? I know I you you had ideas that you at all. You know, there's no way to reverse things. I think that the the priority is not to forget the original one, or for example, just to even think about the 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 point of view of the original owner. So, for example, if you yourself are a dead person, and then you go with your like favorite thing to the afterlife, and then like they take it away, like what is some sort of compromise that you might feel? So, for example, with chalk, I know that those objects will not be put back into the cenote, but in a way to, you know, if I was him, like maybe I could just be around water or something, you know? Uh, so what would be, it's, I mean, it's all about law, really. Like, how do you compromise these two things? So one, you know, so both uh, the past life and the current life can exist together without canceling each other out. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. And, and it also sort of matches what was happening for the tombs or for offerings. Like if you think about, the blocks and blocks of greenstone that were put under the plaza at La Venta to create a watery environment, right? Yeah. It, you know, to to recreate that in a symbolic sense, like to make a watery place. Mm -hmm. Like it, it seems like you are trying to get back to those um, original ways of of creating environments using things and using materials. So. Yeah, because I was like, if I was chalk, I'd be like, oh, those humans are like so messed up, but you know, 100 years is nothing for me. So like, at least put it back somehow, you know? Yeah. At least I can see that you're trying, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then have some leniency, whether there's some sort of judgment on the other side, where it's like, oh, you know what? what? Yeah. So um, in a few minutes, we'll probably open it up to more questions from the audience, but I wanted to ask you about your, um, your contribution to In Plain Sight, the Skywriting Project, which um, I watched your presentation yesterday for um, after the film at the Getty. And, and I have to say that your contribution was the most heartbreaking for me, right? That, because you're you're thinking about communicating with these children in ways that their mother would or their father yeah. would. And what I felt was so interesting about it is also just like when you think about the audience, right? The the intended audience, those who are incarcerated can't see it. And those in power who could change it won't see it, right? Yeah. Or refuse to see it. So like who then is your audience and where does that do you I mean, hope that it leads somewhere i knew that people inside would not be like neither pe person would be able to actually access the whole amount of the text uh, but in a sense i thought that if if the audience saw the project overall you would be able to actually get more meaning and content from the fact that they cannot see it you know, because you see the message and it's like, it's intended for this person. And the fact that they cannot see it is an additional um, 
place to add more content to that specific text because we really did have very few characters to do and I was like okay how can I make the the writing itself or like the relationship between the text and the people underneath like the inaccessibility to it be part of that content you know yeah I know but I was like oh. no but I, but I think that that becomes a, a part of the piece of course that yeah those who need to see it the most can't and yeah. and that's what makes it even more gutting right even yeah. you you, you s it the emotional impact comes through even more of that they're babies who are jailed right through no fault of their own and um for and and so it, it i think it it's a really good educational opportunity for people who may not be aware of or may not be thinking about that children are still being incarcerated because they've crossed the border with their parents seeking asylum and i mean it's still it's i don't even know how to feel about that you know i mean it's so difficult to think about oh like i was talking yesterday it seemed like you know the skywriting gesture is such a large uh form you know this was like a 80 sites and very coordinated i think it was like so expensive and in a sense it's ephemeral so literally the text is up for like three seconds or five seconds until it disperses so i think i think that in a sense it matches the 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 scale absurdity of having these people be incarcerated as well like i was saying yesterday you know the amount of resources and energy that it took to make the project matches the size of the wall that the kids are in, no? Yeah. Yeah, it was also, um, I mean, I know you've, you know, we've, you've said before that, you know, the job of artists is to, or you're thinking about jobs and of the artists to, you know, make illusions, to make people believe in something or, and how do you apply, you know, that to the everyday? And what I find so interesting is the way that I see your work is there, you're not necessarily creating illusions, but you're helping people see through the illusions of institutions that, you know, whether it be a museum or whether it be the our broken immigration system. I mean, is that a fair characterization of what you see as maybe one of the through lines of your work? I mean, it probably you're probably right, but I think that in order to make the work from the like the studio production side, I always sort of see them at like projects as like sort of stages, you know what I mean? Like what is the backdrop, which is the context, like who are the people, the audience, and then my implication is who I am, all the time today, the government, whatever the, the thing is, and then we making a play. You know what I mean? There is like actions that happen within that. There is actual physical forms within that. But I do think that maybe, yes, you are all, you're right. But but I think that from the maker side is different from the audience side. I try to think as an audience as much as possible, but to generate the projects is literally like, let's make a like theater style, mm -hmm. which might function in real life, like documentary theater. That's what I was yeah. talking about where it's like it's not real but it looks very real no <laughs> right right yeah so um i feel like we should i still have questions for you but there are questions okay. in the q a um elizabeth do you want to read or should i you okay. go ahead okay so, the, the, please clarify reference to the person's name on many objects isn't it important in attracting donors yes it's very important to attract donors but i think that that's not the main function of the exhibition space you know like we can have the names and of course it's important to keep those documents but there's so much paperwork that exists outside of the you know the front stage of the museum and especially because it's a public institution you know so it's like a why general public and donor public should be treated all the same, I think. Um, Bella, what do you consider to be the most respectful approach for display of obvious museums that have ongoing ritual function? So one of the examples that I always give, I mean, there are two which I've come up with. The the in, At the Fowler, you know, they do have ritual Tongva objects. And so they are on display at certain times. And then on the weekend or on a scheduled time, uh, the members of the Tongva community can actually go and use them as a 
cemetery. So they do the ritual sites. And so one of the things that's also interesting to me is how the objects within an institution also changes the function of the building itself. So when they're actually using those objects in the ritual form, the museum stops being a museum and it becomes a cemetery, literally, you know. And so for that specific moment, that building stops uh, housing artifacts and is like a cemetery in building shape. Uh, and so it's also being flexible as an institution with the function of the objects. I think the other one that I'm not actually sure where I heard it, but I know that I've heard it somewhere is that in the Museum of the Native American in DC, they have a, a object that is meant to be fed. And so there's somebody there whose work is to feed it corn once in a while. So in a sense, it's just so uh, contradictory to like conservation methodology that it's like, I can just imagine somebody there who's like, there's acid in this corn and I'm actually feeding it. So in that way, it's this really strange compromise where you can actually see that, you know, the, 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 the way of uh, thinking of the people today is actually, they're ceding it to the, this, this um, thing that is like the original function. So I don't know, it's just like suspending it where you're like, I know that I am supposed to maintain the physical integrity of this work and I'm literally putting acid on it because I can respect the fact that it needs to be fed. Um, yeah, and if I can jump in there. So, so that is um, both at the National Museum of the American Indian in DC and also in the Autry um, where they feed corn, corn pollen to um, pieces. So I don't know if there's acid, so it may not, I probably told you, yes. um, but, <laughs> but that's okay. But, but that's the thing. And, and, and those were some interventions. Um, of course, the, the great Rick West, who um, was the founding director at the National Museum of American Indian, and then moved to the Autry and who's retiring this year, his second retirement, um, in, in pushing museums to open up more to indigenous voices, to descendant communities, to not always show things the way that museums always have, right? There's, or treat them. There's been this um, practice that's been set up over the last century or more than a century. And why are those the only ways to treat pieces? And especially who's making the decisions for them, right? People who may have no connection whatsoever to them, except maybe an academic connection or people who have um, a cultural or um, ancestral connection to them. And I think that those uh, moves in museums are incredibly important as we question what we do with pieces that um, have been taken from their original context. So, you know, uh, having people drum them and snuff them. And, you know, I have people who say, why do you have our pieces in boxes, right? They're, they feel trapped. Um, you're not the only person who personifies these pieces. Lots of them do. Um, and um, okay. sorry, yeah. something weird just happened with my uh, computer. But um, yeah, and I think that listening to people about more ways of um, how we treat these pieces is really incredibly important. I mean, so that's, thanks for that. I think that it opens a whole nother set of like repatriation questions that is also, you know, the thing that I thought about was like, if if, if I, if my mother's things were on display, like the repatriating them to me, you know, the next living person or whatever, would still not be a return to the individual person. And I, so I think that it's also thinking through like, not blanket statement overall, but some things cannot actually be returned to its original owner or whoever has a say over how they're displayed altogether, you know? Because I was thinking, okay, like all of the things that I will die with my, um, once I die with my estate or whatever, you know, like even my kids who are, would be like the next kin or whatever would not be able to really have a say on how I, I actually want those things to be, you know? Um, but I do with this last question, yes, I seem to work with the institution. Yes, I love the museum. And so I also thought that it's like, if I was gonna have the dips to be able to complain about the methodological issues that are coming up, I would have to try and approach the conversations of these questions. And so I, I actually do think that, that uh, a better approach is to, when I thought about these questions, like I think that even when we work with the LACMA work and many like the Fowler show, you know, first in, impulse is to be like, are you saying that we're doing something wrong? Like 
pulling out all of the negative things that the institution is, but I really do think that it's our overall institutional problems and uh, to be able to work through them would end up being a better museum overall, you know what I mean? So it's not necessarily like saying like, oh, you're doing this thing wrong because we all understand that these are all uh, inherited methods from like the seventies or whatever. And the museum is like a dinosaur. So in a sense, it's like the way that it will update all of its policies will be so slow that you can't, people who work in it cannot make it any faster. Uh, but I do think that maybe the things that are happening now with these questions of institutional uh, practices and reassessing of collections will definitely make, you know, like put a fire on. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I thank you. That was uh, Lisa Lee's question, our contemporary art professor in the art history department. Um, and I definitely felt, I mean, when you started first started approaching me, I did feel like, oh my gosh, are we being attacked? And then, but then it really began to feel like a collaboration and a rethinking, which was something that I have wanted to do also, right? And, and that's what I said, that it really has influenced my curatorial practice and my teaching and, and moving forward, which is great. Though, though I have a question of, you know, I think there are multiple museums who are turning to artists to say like, hey, how might you display? Come dig around in our collections and put them up and help us ask questions. And I mean, I think one, one question I have is like, is that the artist's job, right? Is it the artist's responsibility to change museums what do, you, what do you think i think it takes a specific practice you know i know that it is not you know at least for me because my work is so much about institutional methods or whatever it's really interesting i mean i always will agree to a project like that when it serves like a bigger question so for example if i can share actually part of the show that i skipped the presentation was this uh you know, I, I was invited to curate a show at the MoCA in LA and I was like, I'm not a curator at all, you know what I mean? Like from the objects from the collection. And so when, when I actually talked to the, the curator who invited me, I was actually like, I can actually get something for my own sort of uh, practice from it. You know, like I'm not gonna be a curator, but then it's also me as an artist did not want to participate in this show because the original, uh, the original proposal that I did for the show was uh, objects that are crappily made. You know what I mean? So it's like, it, once objects are in a collection and they're like made poorly and it's, a, it's literally a conservation show, like how are objects gonna be conserved? And also the main thing is that artists are still alive. So for example, paper pinata from the 60s does not, no, toilet paper pinata from the 60s does not look like it did in the 60s, but the artist is still alive. So can I contact the artist and say, hey, we have acid-free toilet paper now. Can we remake it so it's now actually in physically um, solid and you know the idea won't be sacrificed. The museum will get a really nice like acid-free sculpture. But of course the museum is like, no way, you cannot touch it because it has to be this acid-full toilet paper from the 60s. So in a sense, it's just the methods that it's like, it doesn't matter to the artist that is that specific TP, you know? And so in a sense that I use the show to work through these questions of artist agency, like how much say do people, you know, do we as artists have over our own work while we're alive? And so it's all, you know, contingent works of like how, how, you know, um, you know, Felix Gonzalez Torres was like such an amazing person to uh, learn from because, you know, so many of the things like the audience doesn't see in museums is all of these like forms in the background. So he has said all of these contracts that are like literally, hey curator, you know, the things about this light sculpture is that it needs to have bulbs and it needs to have be on. And literally you can decide whatever shape it is, you know? And so, you know, the, this, the light bulb is really, usually known to be like this vertical dangle thing, but Mocha actually owned two of them. And so this one on the floor is actually the same exact piece because I decided, you know, like me in my curatorial role decided the physical representation of this idea. And so in a sense, it was like, okay, I, I don't necessarily want to curate or work with an institution, but when it comes to like these opportunities where I could actually learn something or like show, you know, I, I thought that this exhibition was, literally for art students because this stuff I didn't know about how to work with institutions when I was in school. And it's like, hey, 
this is how you really do it. And I was like, I actually have been a you know working artist for like 10 years plus, and I still don't know how like parts of the museum work, you know, contemporary museum even. And so, you know, when I do get invited to do these interventions with the with the collections and stuff like that, it really has to be, you know, like I'm not gonna make another show probably about you know, uh, relationship with the collector because I already did that one with you. So the next one will probably be like the accessioning works from the museum show. Right, which you, which you tried to do with us, but we couldn't make that happen. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm push, I'm still, see, this is like, this is what I'm talking about, where it's like, I did propose it to you and it was not physically possible, but eventually somebody <laughs> will agree. Yeah, yeah. So um, we just have a couple of minutes left and, um, I don't see a question in the Q&A, so I'll ask one that I've just been curious about. So I remember, um, well, one, I mean, it's, it's obvious to everyone now that you're really interested in museums and really interested in objects in museums. And I remember you telling me once that you visited museums as a child and when you visited LACMA when you were younger. And, and I just want, can you talk a little bit about like, how that going to museums as a child, because that's you know, one of our major audiences, though they can't come in now um, because of the pandemic. Like, how did that shape you as a thinker or an artist seeing things in museums? I totally went to museums all the time with my dad, but I think that it's just like when you're a kid and you go into this building, the museum, the building itself gives so much value to the objects inside of it that you feel like it's like, oh, it's our human patrimony or some like air of grandiosity. But you know, the other thing that um, I was doing at the time was that we, I moved around a lot when I was little. And so my dad would make me make my own museum. And so it's like all these little bits of trash, like, you know, this is the, calling card that I used to call my mom and this we bought in the specific and the, the date and like cataloging number and all the forms. And so in a sense that really brought it to be like actually those things in the like big museum with capital M one belong to me too. You know, it's like I am also part of like humanity or whatever the building is supposed to hold. And so in a sense, not to feel so removed with being able to think that you might be able to influence the way that is displayed, no? So it, it sort of removed that sort of grand feeling where you're like the Olympics or whatever, you know? <laughs> and it just uh, made it a lot more approachable. Yeah. And I think it's also approaching curators, you know, as an artist, a young artist is very difficult to like approach institutions and be like, hey, can I even talk to you, period, you know? And so in a sense, it's just thinking that you are also a person who is working through the same type of questions because yeah. yeah. of course curators are very unapproachable if you don't if you think of you know them as their job and not that as like a person right and and I think also you have a generation of curators who want to ask these questions um, as opposed to I think in the past it's like oh wait don't ask those questions because it might, you know, disrupt the system or open the floodgates, you know, how can we make these a part of our, of our work and our practice, um, both as curators and educators? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. I thought the same thing, because it's like, I would love to second, second life job is to be like a conservator and work with that. So I, I really do think that the museum is the people who work inside of it. And so mm -hmm. it, it's not that you know, the general sentiment would be to just be like, it, there's no way we're gonna think about these like 80s, 70s, 60s style methods anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, when the pandemic is over, uh, we want to bring you to Atlanta and come to Emory and we have a wonderful conservation lab in the museum and it would be great to have you in there and talk to our conservators as well, because they're also interested in these um, issues of um, what kind of treatment, how do you change over time in the way that you're addressing pieces as well. So I hope you'll say yes to that invitation when it comes. Yeah, yeah, I've never been there. I wanna go. I wanna go anywhere right now. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Elizabeth Horner for organizing and setting up the webinar. And thank you so much to Gala and Gary for uh, sharing your morning with us. Um, 